Two things at the outset. If you have any questions, suggestions, or corrections, don't be afraid to raise your hand. We have a small surcharge if you ask a question, but that's not <laughs> <laughs> um, At the outset, I want to thank Wikipedia. Uh, all of the photographs in this, in this presentation, except for one, came from Wikipedia. They allow you to use them for things such as this freely and no, no problems. What they do ask you, though, is that you attribute a, uh, to whom the, the, the photographer who took the picture or what have you. We have, I have pages of that here if someone wants to see them. Um, there are about 10% are private individuals, the rest are common domain, and generally the U.S. Navy. The one photograph that is not from Wikipedia is this one right here. <clears throat> it's my father's photograph taken of one of his planes in World War I. <laughs> this is a Junkers J-1. Now the German military called them the J-1, Junkers called them the J-5. They already had a J-1 all metal long plane fighter. Uh, this was a plane that was way ahead of its time. Uh, it was very heavy. It could not fly from an unimproved airstrip. Anyway, this, uh, this was an all-metal airplane. It uh, was very heavy. I have another slide <coughs> here. Around the, from the front of the engine to the back of the observer's cockpit was surrounded by an armored tub. In that tub was the engine, the pilot, the, uh, the observer, machine guns and the fuel. And you say, how do they fit all of that in there? Well, the two seats, the one the observer and the pilot sat in were form-fitting like chairs with a cushion and a strap of course to keep you in. And it enveloped you completely. That was the gas tank. You sat right down in it. So you were betting your life on that orbit. <laughs> yeah, think about that. Is that a Mercedes-Benz engine? <laughs> it could be. Uh, these things flew over the uh, front lines. They flew along the trenches. They dropped messages and supplies and what have you. Uh, this heavy airplane, there is no allied or central power record of one having ever been shot down. It was impervious to machine gun fire. It could fly right on through it. Uh, it was so heavy and all this that. Uh, right, next slide. Yeah. That uh, the German pilots called it the Rebelwagen, which means the furniture van. <laughs> Here's a picture of a German twin engine pusher, Friedrichshafen. Um, there were several uh, large planes of this type that Germany had. They had the Gotha. They had even bigger planes, the Stocken. Italy had its huge Caproni. Uh, England, and I think I've got them right up on my shoulder here, had the Handley Page. Um, Russia had its Leo Moronets, the giant. And uh, the pilots who flew these things, my father included, were the world's first multi engine rated pilots. And those props didn't feather, did they? <laughs> no, they did not. They pulled them on and prayed. <laughs> Could they fly in one engine? Probably I don't not. know. I'll, I'll tell you this. If the fuel, it's not a little story I'll throw in here. If the fuel, if the engines were stopped for fuel, it came down. My father was in this thing alone. Why alone? I don't know. And the engines stopped for lack of gasoline. Uh, we had gas on board. He tried a thing called a wobble pump that didn't make it work. He managed to get it around and head down the field before the <coughs> airdrome to get around again, running to the, into the wind. That didn't work. He came down in a field. That big front wheel caught a, a uh, shell crater and it flipped over upside down. Thankfully, he wasn't injured or anything. The steerman is here for a sentimental reason. 23 years ago, my wife and I were going down to well, Plum Island, Massachusetts, every Newburyport, Mass, to go to the beach. Lovely, lovely area. On the way to the beach, we passed the Palm Island Airport, and there was a sign, biplane rides, $25, I think. So we took a biplane ride. It was a plane. It was not a Stearman. It was a 1927 Curtis, as a matter of fact. Same type of plane. The, the rear cockpit held the pile of the front cockpit about two people side by side. This thing, he flew it up. He flew west up over the town of Newburyport, a very quaint little New England town. Flew west for quite some distance, turned it around, came back towards the town of Newburyport, and shut the engine off. 
<laughs> and it was just like this. It's just also, and then you could hear the wind. <laughs> and we just came down miles over the town. I remember boy just gliding in like a big bird. And I said, boy, my plane sense it for me. <laughs> um, next. Here we have the Curtis Jenny JN4 that, that uh, Ken just mentioned that we have out here. The Jenny was developed in World War I. It was a trainer. There were some advanced trainers that did have machine guns and bombs. There were 6,800 of these things built. And they were the heart and soul of aviation in the 1920s in America. They say 95% of the young men that learned to fly in those days learned to fly in a Jenny. In fact, Lindbergh did indeed get his solo in a Jenny. There were so many of them that you could buy one surplus in the 1920s. It came in several crates. The price for a Jenny in the 1920s was $50. Here. Next, please. This is the Curtis OX-5 engine. It was already, like with so many things in the aircraft, outdated by the time it was built, but it did the job. There were 1,250 of these. Uh, engines and they were there with power the journey. Next. A very little known airplane is the twin engine journey, the JN5. There were eight of these, that's probably why they weren't that well known because there were so few of them. <clears throat> but they were used, they were built to be a long range observation aircraft. And uh, there they are, twin engine journey. What they did was they expanded the, the, the length of the top wing and the middle and the bottom wing. Uh, and that's how they got uh, a bigger airplane to put the two engines on. Next. The Jenny was one of the first air gun ambulances. The turtle deck behind the car, the cop pilot's cockpit would come off. You would uh, stretch it, you see, laying on the ground, pop it in there, put the turtle deck back on, and there you go. Next. First air to air refueling was on. Oh, let me get this right, June 27th, 1923. And uh, if it's not something that the Air Force does this all the time, and it's rather very modern, but the first air ever refueling was indeed the Jenny. Um, by the way, my uh, father's flight instruments, I donated to this museum, and if you want to see his recording barograph, or what they call also a flight recorder, it's in the display room where all the uniforms are, the last cabinet to the right, counterclockwise, clockwise, I'm sorry. <clears throat> Next, please. This it doesn't look very pretty because the landing gear is off, but this is my favorite airplane, biplane of all time. It's the Curtis BF 2C. There's a much nicer photograph of this thing coming up. Uh, you'll see how pretty a plane it is. Now, I will tell you this this is my favorite plane. Don't take me with you to the horse track because, and have me bet on a horse, because this airplane enjoys the shortest, shortest service life of any aircraft in the United States military ever. It was brought out in November of 1934. By October of 1935, they were gone. Why, for some reason, the upper wing harmonized with the Curtis Wright engine and it destroyed itself. So you'd be flying along and all of a sudden the right, the top wing would just completely disassemble and you better be ready with the parachute. <laughs> uh, the only reason I can ascribe this to is that that airplanes were in a transition. We were transitioning from, you know, this is 19, 1934. <coughs> biplanes are 15 years ago or more in World War I. We still haven't come completely out of the biplane era, except for some other planes that I will mention. And <clears throat> I'm beginning to wonder if they try to do too much too fast. You're taking a World War I design and you're making a metal, all metal fighter out of it, a fighter plane. I mean, they were fighters in World War I, but they were pretty, you know, they flew low and slow and what have you. Oh, by the way, that, that Junkers flew at all, all, at all the speed of 93 miles an hour uh, when French Spad 13s were doing 135. So I think they were trying to do too much too fast. Next, please. The plane that replaced it was the Boeing F-4B-4. Uh, this is in Army colors. I just love the colors of these things, all of the silvers and yellows and other colors and so forth. They're really very pretty. Now I seem to remember reading sadly that uh, the 
when they discovered that they had Curtis and the Navy mechanics worked night and day to try to solve this top on this assembly problem. And of course, you never knew what was happening or was solved until you flew the plane a whole lot. And if it disassembled on you, well, it wasn't solved. So the Navy finally said, okay, we're finished with them. Get rid of them. And they sent a message to the, uh, the carrier. Yeah, just escape. Don't come back to it. Like the carrier that they were on. There were 27 of them on there, and they said, don't even, don't even think of bringing them back to San Diego. Uh, take it and dump them over the side. <laughs> Was the disassembly with the Boeing F four B four, or was it with the previous? The previous. The previous. Oh, okay, okay. I'm sorry. Didn't make the comment. This one, this one was fine. We're going to come back to this. Um, so that they went into the drink. Next slide, please. Now to show you how <laughs> um, this is a rather ungainly aircraft. It's a Hanley Page mm -hmm. Inferno, and uh, this thing was developed in 1934 the same time that that metal fighter you saw. And this thing was flown by the RAF. You can see we're still, we're still harking back. You can, you can see the World War I airplanes, uh, uh, biplanes in this. And, and by the way, in World War I, a trivia is, were there bigger planes in World War I or World War II? Not as heavy in World War I, but they were way bigger in, in size. World War II, they were smaller and heavier. So this Hanley Page Hayford flew in the RAF until 1941. And you've got to stop and think, that was a year after the Battle of Britain, when you had hurricanes and Spitfires and Messerschmitts tangling. This thing was still in the inventory. What were they using it for? Pardon me? What were they using it for? Training multi-engine pilots or what? I, I would imagine they were looking at they were looking at a at a uh, I seem to see some stores beside the uh, left landing gear up under the wing. You're probably looking at a long range bomber. We're looking at the start of, of a, a strategic aircraft. We'll come to that uh, quite uh, deeply in a little while. Next slide, please. Here's one of our all American heroes, Jimmy Doolittle. Uh, he will influence the war on both sides of the earth, from the Pacific and in Europe. Uh, anyway, back in, on May 25, 1927, uh, he did the first outside loop in a Curtis P1C. Next slide, please. Doing an inside loop is, is kind of an understandable thing. You pull the stick back, the plane does this. Chief forces kind of make you part of the plane. It's kind of like, you know, riding on a music park right? Doing a forward loop, an outside loop, you're, 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 you're doing this, you're falling constantly. And it's, it's, it's a pretty gnarly thing to do. He brought it off, he started at 10,000 feet, then he said, I either complete the loop or I crash it on the ground. And die. <laughs> he completed the loop. Something else, next slide, please. On the 24th of September 1929, in the Curtis and Consolidated NY2, he did the first totally blind instrument flight. Uh, there was a pilot in the front cockpit, or in the back, I'm not sure where Doodle was front or back, but he was in there. They completely boxed him in, they sealed him in completely. He couldn't see out anywhere, he was in this black box. All he had was the instrument pad here. The other pilot got it off the ground, and then he says, you got it. And he flew, I guess, a triangular course, quite involved, came back and got it just about lined up to the runway, and then the other pilot said, I've got it, because he couldn't, you know, the instruments weren't that great in those days to get you, like, right on the runway, but he got pretty close. He did that all by himself. Now, next slide. Well, here we have a B-25 Mitchell. And you say, what has this got to do with biplanes? Well, this plane was developed at the same time you had those biplane fighters that you saw. And you know, you, if you're familiar with the, the, uh, the Doolittle Raid, named for Doolittle because he was the lead officer, he was actually in the raid, he flew a plane, took off from the carrier Hornet, overflew the mainland of Japan, bombed, went on in China. The Japanese said, whoa, bombing our mainland, they've got to become, the Japs could never put it together that you had medium bombers coming off of an aircraft carrier. Aircraft carriers worked with those little, that, that Curtis BF-2C that you saw. They didn't work with medium bombers, little did they know. 
So they said it must be Midway. So ensued was the Battle of Midway in April 1942. The Japs lost four of their major, huge, brand new fleet carriers. <clears throat> and at that point, the Japanese Navy losing, I think there were six carriers in total, they lost four. You, they never stopped, well, as far as the surface warfare went, they never stopped staggering backwards. Thanks to Jimmy Doolittle leading this raid. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Now, what do you have to do with the uh, war in Europe? Here we have a German officer, Ernst Student. He's got the uh, Ritzkreuz, the Knight's Cross. He has the Bumax, the Polymerit. He was a German fighter pilot in World War I after Baron von Richthofen, who shot down 80 Allied planes. He shot down 62. <clears throat> Back in the 1920s and early 30s, Jimmy Doolittle worked for Curtis. He, when he went around Central America and South America selling export fighters. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Such as the Curtis Falcon, trying to build up business for the aircraft company. And what he demonstrated back in those days, there was no Norton bomb site. So level bombing, as we understand it, just wasn't something that was happening. But what was really good and really accurate was dive bombing. And, and, and Vince Odette was another barnstormer. He came to the United States. He went to these air shows, these demonstrations. And he saw time and time again, he saw Jimmy Doodle take, Doodle take this thing and put it in a vertical dive and bang, hit the target every time. So Hamster then said, aha, that's the future of aviation. We didn't know about Norton bomb sites and things. It's dive bombing. And Hamster Death went back to Germany. He became the, uh, the head of procurement and testing for the Luftwaffe. Through his influence, the Germans depended a lot on dive bombing, the Stucker being the most famous, but all the German planes, the Ju-88, the Do 17 and what have you, the, the H-111 would dive bomb, but you were, of course, you were restricted to tactical bombers. And as a result of that, Germany never developed a strategic, that is, B-17, B-24, Lancaster, they never developed a bomber of that ilk. So in your Battle of Britain, they could go over, they could hammer London and, and things of this on that side of Britain, but they could never overfly far enough to bomb the British aircraft factories, which would have really put a different note on the Battle of Britain if they would have wiped out the factories where the planes were coming from. Knocking them down one at a time in the sky is one thing. Destroying the whole assembly line, you destroyed how many hundred planes in one whack. The same thing happened when the German when Germany went Again, to war with Russia in 1941. Odette realized that at that point, 1941, Hitler has just invaded Russia. The Germans are capturing millions of Russian troops. <clears throat> Everything's going Germany's way. They're occupying France. They gave up the Battle of Britain, but well, gee, you know. And after that, realized we can never, ever overcome the giant country that Russia is because her manufacturing plants are beyond the Urals, places where they made between 65 and 85,000 T-34 tanks. Think about that. We cannot stop their industrial production. And he realized in 1941, when Germany was knocking everything to pieces, that it wasn't going to happen at all. And he was so distraught that he shot himself. Next slide, please. <laughs> But here we have a, for the time, a more modern uh, dive bomb, a Curtis Hell Diver. Uh, this will come up again as a Curtis FB 2C. Uh, the, the same big tail and the same body, pretty much, but it'll be a monoplane. Next slide, please. German pocket battleship Grashve. Pocket battleship means cruiser size battleship guns. It's pretty much what that comes out to. This thing is in the South Atlantic, given the British fits. And uh, they, they set out a small task force to locate this thing and sink it. Well, next slide, please. But located it was a biplane, a very Sea Fox. Now you say, whoops, that's not a carrier plane. No, it's not. 
because in that task force there was not a carrier. There was just a cruiser and something else. It was three ships. It killed the users of this and that and so forth. I forget the other two. <clears throat> ships of that size back in the day had launching catapults. And they would, they, a battleship would have two, sometimes four, airplanes on, on catapults, on rails. And they could be turned. We'll see that in a moment. And you'd put an airplane on there and you'd shot it off. Next slide, please. This is America's premier, the Curtis SOC Seagull. Wonderfully great airplane. And you'd be on the ship and it would shoot you off. Next slide. Here you see the, oops. Here you see the, the rail and a plane. And here we have another plane getting ready to be moved forward and dropped on the rail. Some ships had the rail attached to the top of the main turrets so that <clears> the turret could turn on the ship and actually face right into the direction of the wind that you wanted it to face. Didn't have to turn the whole ship and face, uh, face the rail. And then, next please. Ching, off it would go. His, uh, his Majesty's ship Bermuda with the Supermarine Wall. As you can see the rack that, that the Walrus was nesting right here, was nesting in over here. This thing would go here and slam, and off it would go. Well, one salient fact here, look at the surface of the ocean. Pretty good, pretty nice. So, no sweat. Off goes the walrus, it goes and does its mission. See, comes back, lands nicely in the water. They put a line over from a crane, hook it up, back on the ship, and then the pilot needs to step out and everything's well. If it's at all sharp at a certain point, the plane can't land. If it's a great day like this and a squall comes up, the plane goes back and the waves are heaving and hoeing and so forth, guess what? <laughs> you land the plane, it destroys itself. <laughs> when you put it in the water of that chop and you hope that you can be rescued by that ship uh, before you, it's too late for you. And by the way, look, look here. Just as an aside, coal fired ships, this is why you can see them. Miles and miles and miles over the horizon. You didn't have to be right on top of them. Um, you could see that, that smoke coming up. So these are scouts, and a battleship might have how many scout planes? Pardon me? A battleship or a heavy cruiser might have how many scout planes? Yeah. Two or four. Or yeah, four yeah two or four. Some of them actually easily, easily <laughs> even had hangers. And those planes would be, you had to have this thing be dismountable. Those wings would be dismountable and you, you couldn't have that thing. If you went into a real storm and that thing sitting bolted to the, it's going to get destroyed. So you took it in pieces and you put it, sometimes you could actually put it inside of a hangar. Um, Did Dorner make a biplane like this called a ball? A Dorner ball? Ball? Yes. It looks like this, but it's a totally yeah, different Yeah, yeah, don't you, yeah. Next slide, please. Here is the most famous biplane of them all. Now you, here is a here is a World War One plane. Sure enough, in World War Two, it's it's the ferry. Oh, no. <laughs> I will say it's not it's not the sea fox. I was the swordfish. Swordfish. I got it. Here we go. Ferry swordfish. Carry three people: the pilot, the torpedo officer, and the observer gunner. And this thing is famous for the the most famous miss. In the Second World War. The Bismarck, the most modern battleship in the world, is in the North Atlantic and it's going to get out into the sea lanes and it's going to cause the British havoc. A task force gets in the range of the Bismarck, part of the task force gives the HMS Hood. The Hood is the darling of England. Anytime the Royals review the, the naval parade every year, the Hood is where they are. Anytime something big with procedure happens for the Navy, it's done on the hood. It's the darling of the, of, the, of, the, of the nation. The hood was everybody's ship. The Bismarck's fire director comes up with a solution. All of her guns fire at once. There's a great puff of smoke. And 30 seconds later, the hood has disappeared from the face of the earth. Out of 1,470-some sailors, three were found it. When the British ships went over there and looked around, where's the hood? That's when the Clarion Call came out, sink the Bismarck. They finally found the Bismarck again, and these planes attacked with the torpedoes. Now, the Bismarck had a 22 inch armored belt of Kruppenstahl, Krupp steel, or 
or on her milk, or on her water line, and the torpedoes couldn't affect it. They bang, nothing would happen. So the British said, look, we're going to take and keep putting the torpedoes at one spot again and again and again, and it's, it's got to eventually break that armor belt. You know, really. Well, this guy's flying, this pilot's flying over there. He's got a thousand foot long target, okay? Given the fact, though, that every gun on that target is firing at him, but he's got a thousand foot long target, he drops a torpedo and he misses, almost. That torpedo just ticks the rudder on the back end of the Bismarck, slams it over, the rudder weighs tons and tons and tons, slams it over, and the Bismarck now can only steam in a circle. And that was the end of the Bismarck. The British never sunk it, technically. Well, they pounded it into a into a candidate to be towed to a junkyard. But the actual sinking was done by the German crew over the sea box and scuttling the thing. And the German sailors realized this is preposterous. The German uh, Admiral Lydians, one of the famous German admirals, and for whom they have a guided missile cruiser named to this day, uh, was on that ship and they said, sink it. Put on your life jackets, get into the water. The water was very, very cold, and it was 2,400 to 2,330 died of hypothermia. Next slide, please. The, of course, the swordfish that has holding wings is just so many, and this was, of course, a carrier craft. There was no, no launching from catapults here. And, uh, you had to have these things full to put it on the carrier. And I'll tell you, I'm looking at that, that hinge uh, business up here, and I, I if you think the Kurdish <laughs> BF2C was tricky, how tricky is this thing? It, and when you stop and think, it's a world, you have the world's most modern, huge battleship. The pride of Blowman Foss, where she was built, disabled. By effectively a World War One airplane, things wooden cloth. So that that's the biplanes were still very viable in World War Two. By the way, if you want to see Kruppenstahl, Kruppsteel, take a look at the top of the Chrysler Building in New York City. Next slide, please. In the 1930s, the Navy had two aircraft carriers. And you say. <laughs> That's a, that's a derivative. No, it's not. It's an aircraft carrier. Uh, the USS Akron from, 19, from September 31 to April 33, and the USS Macon from March of 33 to uh, February 35. Named after two cities in Ohio because the presence there of Goodyear tire and rubber. Goodyear developed a rubberized cotton to make the airbags. Oh, I'm sorry. Helium bags that gas bags were responsible for this thing being able to, uh, to fly. Uh, up until that time, the bags in these dredgeables are 6,000 feet long. So was the Hindenburg. You can imagine how big those bags were, how many there were. They were made out of a thing called gold beater's skin. And gold beater's skin was cow's intestines that were taken and laboriously laid out. And women would sit there and sew tiny, 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 tiny stitches from one piece to another to make a bag to fill with either helium or, in the Hindenburg's case, hydrogen. Unfortunately, the um, Akron had a whoops. We're not going to like that. Well, that's okay. The Akron had a uh, terrible mishap. It crashed in a storm off the coast of New Jersey. Of uh, 77 crew members, 74 were lost. A greater loss of life than in the Hindenburg. Uh, the Macon crashed off a of big Sur in California. Three people were lost. The rest of the crew was, was uh, rescued. Now we're talking about biplanes. These two airships were aircraft carriers. This is a Waco UVF inside the USS Macon. It's a two place plane. Uh, next slide, please. This is a civilian walk over this way. Isn't that pretty? Wouldn't you like to just take a ride in that? Man, um, this is what the walk by UBF looked like. And it had an appendage at the top here. Next slide, please. The planes that we used mostly were the Sparrow, the uh, Curtis Sparrowhawks. And you had this great device. This is a, 
like a backwards there's a hook here on top this is part of the airplane this business right here that thing facing forward that never goes away that's part of the plane and it would come along and slide along this thing you would almost start sliding the hook the hook and this thing would come down and grab the tail and keep it from flopping all around and it would get picked up into the aircraft carrier and everything was in that dirigible, that would be in a regular aircraft carrier. Maintenance, parts, fuel, other stores, what have you. And the thinking of the time in the 1930s was we're going to build fleets of these giant dirigibles. They're each going to hold a dozen medium bombers, and we're going to go, when we need to go fly to wherever we have to go fly, and have these things arrive with a dozen bombers and drop them out of the, they dropped out of this, it was a T-slick shaped slot bottom of the dirigible, they would drop these fighters off, to, and in that case, medium bombers on the bottom and off they would go. But because of the crash of the two Navy dirigibles and the, the Hindenburg, even though it wasn't a U.S. Navy dirigible at all, and happened quite some years later, because of that, public opinion was so against dirigibles that they gave up on the idea of airborne dirigibles dropping medium bombers and instead went to the carriers that we know and understand today. Next slide, please. Are the big hangars over in Tustin, are those related or do those come later? There's big blimp hangars in Orange County. At El Toro. Yeah, El Toro. Uh, the, the hangars are up at the Moffat Field. And, and Moffat also. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. You can see the, uh, you can see that T-shaped area in the floor. This is, this is a sparrow hawk. I mean, they would blow them, drop, they would drop them down. Of course, the engine would be running. And here's that, that hook on the top, and this is crane device that would lower them out from the bottom of the, of the dirigible, and the pilot would slow his plane, I guess, or something, and unhook them, hook them off, he'd go. And the landing gear was detachable. If you weren't expecting to land, it land anywhere coming back to the dirigible, you just need the landing gear away, and it was made at that major air impedance a lot less, and uh, you came back to the dirigible. Next, please. Okay, back to my favorite airplane. There's something real slick here because those wheels have been folded up. Now, I want to speak for a moment about the NACA cowl. NACA stands for National Aeronautics Committee, right. National yeah, Committee, Committee, on Committee on Aviation. Yeah. And it was always NACA, it was never called NACA. But that's interesting because NACA became NASA, and we always say NASA instead of NASA. And uh, the, uh, the day that, that, uh, that Congress authorized this to happen was uh, July 29th, 1958, and I know that date absolutely because that was my 21st birthday. <laughs> this is the NACA Powell. Before this, airplanes flew with their Cylinders stuck out in the air. The air, idea it's an air cooled engine, get air over those cylinders. Well, NACA came up with the thought if we put a cowl around that and compress that air as it's rammed through there, it'll be more effective. The first plane they put that, excuse me, cowl on, before they put the cowl on, it flew at 117 miles an hour. With the cowl, it flew at 136. Problem <laughs> solved. <laughs> Next, please. Back to the Boeing P-12, which replaced the Curtis uh, BF-2C. Now, the Navy had these on the carriers, and they said, you know, wouldn't it be nice? That Curtis had folded landing gear. That would have been awesome to have that on the Boeings. So they approached Leroy Grumman, who had developed the folded landing gear for some other plane that he was supplying somebody. The Navy said, can you come up with a folded landing gear for the Boeing? What do you think? Sure, Leroy says, no sweat. Well, he's smarter than a fox. He doesn't come up with a folding landing gear on the Boeing. Next slide, please. He comes up with the Grumman F1F, formerly known as the Fifi. This is 1931. This is a Navy fighter of the day. It's a two-person plane. Again, harking back to World War I, uh, we can't get rid of that pilot observer thing, but we will in a while. Uh, had two 30-caliber machine guns. <coughs> Uh, rifle caliber, they're not very big, had this type of the landing gear that Leroy Grumman developed. This took 30 turns of a hand crank to either bring up 
covering down. Next slide, please. Now to the F1, now to the following one's Fifi, come out with a Roman F2F. This is a single person plane. We don't have the two, two person cockpit anymore. It's shorter, but it has the Grumman fat look. Grumman made fat, chunky fighters. But believe me, this was aviation in the United States. This was top of the line in the, in the 1930s. So up through 1941. Next slide, please. Grumman F3F. This is the Navy's top fighter. With that funny line, pulling landing gear, what have you. This is the top fighter of the late 1930s, early 1940s. This is the top of the line. High powered, high, high priced, all metal fighter. But, what did we learn, especially at the Battle of, of uh, at the bombing of Pearl Harbor? The neatest, slickest, most maneuverable aircraft in the world was the Japanese Zero A6N. And the United States Navy people took a look at that and said, wow. There's no way that we are going to be able to have a biplane fight that Jap fighter. And, and by the way, I forgot a, a salient fact earlier in talking about developing biplanes and, and, and developing fighters. Germany in the mid 1930s put out a bid for fighters. Three companies responded, Messerschmitt and two others, I don't know the name of them. Another one, one of the others had a fighter, as we understand it. The third company proposed a biplane. Can you imagine a biplane for the fighter of the 1940s? Can you imagine Spitfires and Mustangs tangling with biplanes? <laughs> anyway, that's exactly what happened here. Can you imagine a Jap Zero tangling with this? Eat it for lunch. So they said, well, like, Grumman, do something. He said, okay, we'll just take the top wing and throw it away. We'll take the bottom wing and put it right here, and we'll leave it, we'll give it probably a bigger and better engine. We'll leave everything pretty much the same, and voila, and slide, please. You have the Grumman XF4F. This is still the fat barrel look. Everything's the same except the bottom wing isn't here. It's right there, the top wing, of course, is history. And by the way, this plane, unlike most planes, had little windows in the bottom, so the pilot could look out down between his feet and see what's going on down there. Next slide, please. Goes into the fleet inventory as a Grumman F4F, the Wildcat. Hmm. Uh, very effective plane for what it was. Again, uh, unfortunately, the pilots were very much dismayed. We still had the 30 cranks of the hand wheel. However, the two rifle caliber machine guns were gone. Instead, we had four 50 caliber machine guns. Now you're talking. Now these things set up and they go into combat with the Jap Zero. Plane on plane, they cannot outfight the Zero. You're told if you get into a tangle with one Zero, dive. Your, 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 your weight that you have will make you dive a lot faster. Zero can't keep up with you in a dive. So you can die and get away and come back and fight another day. Also, interestingly, <laughs> look at this red dot that was called the meatball. Now, Japanese planes, of course, had one great big meatball, the rising sun. And the United States, this was the national signal, the white star, the blue background, and the red dot. That was it in 1942. They had it go away with the red dot, and it's gone to this day because gunners on U.S. Navy ships, all they saw was that little tiny red meatball and they would start banging away at our own airplanes. So what does the F-4F ever do until 1943 when the F-6F, the Hellcat, came out and that was a plane designed to overcome the Jap Zero? What do you do in a dogfight? You have an officer whose name was Thach, T-H-A-C-H, who came up with the Thach weave. And I sometimes I really need a third hand for this, but you have two wildcats flying along like this, okay? The zero comes up on the tail of one of them. And you do this. And you understand that at one point they're gonna cross each other, and the zero behind this one is gonna cross right in front of those four fifty caliber machine guns. The Japanese pilot has a decision to make. He can either break off the engagement defy all the code Bushido he's been told and believes in, 
Or he could keep going and die for the emperor and wind up at the Yasukuni Shrine in Tokyo that night. <laughs> Kill ratio, zero, one, wildcat, 5.1. Five to one kill ratio because of the fact weave. Every time you get into this, the zero would not break off and he was dead meat. Zero had no armor plating, very few good radios, no self sealing fuel tanks, one incendiary 50 caliber in that fuel tank. There was a great puff of smoke and there was nothing left. Japanese plane gone. <coughs> Next slide, please. One of my favorite planes is the Grumman J2F Duck. It was the last Navy plane to leave Manila when the Japs took over. It had a crew of two or three. And down below here was another cabin, down with this, this great big Swanson. And it's not really an airplane, it's a flying boat because of this big hull. And because of that, look at this thing, you can see why it was called the Duck. It had a little duck spill. A tremendous airplane used for search and rescue all through the Second World War. Some of these are still flying down in the 1960s in Peru. Wonderful airplane. Next slide, please. <clears throat> now, here's something you might not have heard of. Colin Parkhoff, PO2. Most built biplane in history, over 30,000 of them built. Built from the beginning of World War II up until the late 1900s. <clears throat> Russian biplane, here's exposed cylinders. No NACA cowl here, folks. And what on earth is a World War One airplane? This Bingo, no folding land gear, no no cowl, two people, what have you. What is this, what are the Russians doing with this? This thing had the most rackety, bangety, lousy sounding engine ever put in an airplane. The German troops call it the neighbor machine, the sewing machine. What they would do with this thing, the Russians had women primarily, very few men, mostly all women, who would fly these things over the German lines, real low and slow at night to keep the German troops awake, who needed their sleep after a hard day's combat. <coughs> and they were called the, the Nachthexen, the night witches. And next slide, please. Here's Arena Sabrova, who flew 1,008 missions over the German lines. Of course, the German troops wouldn't just sit there to take this sitting or, excuse me, lying down. They'd jump out of their sleeping bags and they'd blaze away at these pipelines and everything they had, and there was a great attrition. They shot down a lot of them. But Rita Sobrova made it through a thousand and eight missions. She probably got the order of the Red Star here somewhere. Next slide, please. One of my favorites, civilian airliner by Havilland, Dragon Rapide. Isn't that just elegant? Beautiful. Uh, eight place passenger airplane back in 1931. People were hardly thinking of passenger planes as, as a group of passengers. Oh, there was a you know a contract carry here and there, and it occurred, as Jenny would say. But Dragon Rapide was, it was a very successful, lovely aircraft. Uh, next slide, please. If the Dragon Rapide is great, how's about a four engine Dragon Express? Lousy airplane. Built it from 1933 to 1936. They'd rather crash than look at you. <laughs> you know, the repeat was just wonderful. They, they built that thing up until the, you know, for 18 years, and they still flew those in the 1980s. This thing here just, just didn't work. It was like the Curtis the, the, the BF2C. Golly gee, we could do a two engine, why can't we do a four? Um, airplanes are funny things. Um, when Germany designed the most successful fighter, World War I, the, the, the Fokker uh, D7, the first time they put the Fokker out there was a death trap. They couldn't control it. Someone from Fokker said, let's just stick four feet more between the cockpit and the tail and see what happens. Bingo, now you get your fighter. So it's just, you know, how many test pilots have died testing airplanes? Uh, because some, and then they made some little change, and now you have a world beater. Interesting. Next slide, please. Curtis Condor, a 12 place passenger aircraft. Uh, Eastern and American had these, and they fitted them out with high, high tech, if you will, bunks and such and, flat and what have you. And you had a 12 passenger sleeper, and you could fly someplace overnight. In fact, Eastern had a line from Dallas to Los Angeles. 
Interesting thing about this, this is the first passenger liner with folding landing gear. And the landing gear folded backwards and up into the engine nacelles and left a portion of the tire sticking out just like the DC-3, or DC-2 if you will. And can you see a DC-3 body here, a fuselage? I can, and here the, 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 light, the lights in the nose like the DC-2 had. Just interesting that this thing is a Curtis, but it looks an awful lot like a Douglas. I don't know. Next slide, please. <clears throat> oh, yeah. Staggering. Gorgeous airport. Top wing in back for, uh, for visibility and maneuverability. Uh, five place uh, pilot and four passengers. They were built with the idea to be a space folding landing gear, to be a small passenger airliner, and they were used to that a whole lot. When they came out, they could outfly any military plane we had in the inventory. And as a matter of fact, next slide please. This is a military plane you can see from the, the officer's crest here. The military bought hundreds of these. Here's the national uh, insignia on the tail or whatever. Bought hundreds of these. Voted on one of the 10 most beautiful airplanes of, uh, uh, 10 of the most favorite airplanes ever made and has been voted the loveliest airplane as far as looks goes, ever. Next, next slide, please. Antonov AN2, a beast. This thing, and there's one of these sitting at Plum Island Airport, by the way, sitting in the grass next to the runway, and it belongs to uh, uh, Bach, Richard Bach, who wrote Jonathan Livingston Seagull. This is a huge plane, and very capable. Uh, it'll carry anything. In Russia, there are perhaps over a thousand of these flying for Aeroflot in the hinterland, doing this and doing that, where you don't need a great big airplane like a DC something or other. Um, very cargo, it'll carry 12 people, easy, without batting an eye. Uh, flies like a radio controlled airplane. <laughs> Go on YouTube and come up with Anton of and you'll get You'll get videos to show you how this thing can go. One thing I read, a fellow was on one of these things, there were like four passengers, and the rest of the plane had no seats because the rest of the plane was jam-packed full of a herd of goats. <laughs> and, oh, it's, 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 it's that kind of a plane. If you want to get close and personal with Antonov AN2, we have one here at the museum. Next slide, please. Okay, the last slide, you say, okay, he slipped his wig. <laughs> We're talking biplanes here, are we? Yes, this is a biplane. Uh, trust me, OV-10 Bronco, here's we got now. Very capable twin turboprop, a uh, hot little ship. See these things here? They're called winglets or sponsons. And they were put on there for the same reason that wings were put on the bottom wings were put on biplanes in World War One. Control and stability. That's all we needed on this. We didn't have it all the way out here somewhere. But that's all that's needed. This is a wing. And I contend that, unless you can show me in a book that says, at such and such a point it becomes a biplane, if the wing is less than X number of inches, it's, oops, it's not a biplane. So, <laughs> this, this I propose to you as being a, a very, very modern biplane. And uh, I think the next slide is probably not there. You know, this is the sources of images. Um, you can see where they... San Diego Museum, New York Air Force Navy. Uh, <coughs> here and there are, uh, I think there's three pages of these. Here's a man named Pinkstone, who put out the picture of the walk over one of his personal photographs. Anonymous, Vader and Cargo of People, that's the West End USA for Air. Levins is another person that put out the Lost Hawk photograph. I think there's one more page of, yeah. Uh, Stagger in the and Creative Commons. Um, a Hunt is another person. MFAM, I don't know what that means, but that's what it said on Wikipedia. Uh, that's us. That's us. us. Marshfield, Marshfield Air, Air Museum. Museum. <laughs> <laughs> yeah? Yes. Ah, yeah, you're right. Oh, that's right. Ah, yeah, okay. Marshfield. It's a sterling. I had a different, I had a different Antonov picture, and uh, he was going to change it. I said, "Well, I like this one better." He said, "Yeah, but we have our own." I said, "Okay, fine." So that is your Antonov that we had a picture of. Okay, I didn't know that until right now. Thanks for pointing it out. And that's.
Thank you. 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 Thank you.